We have to realize that it takes about 150,000 horsepower to drive the fuel pumps that pump the fuel into the combustion chamber That's or into the rocket fuel pump. That's just to drive the fuel pump. But we really haven't come up with a different method of propulsion in the last 40 years, have we? Uh, no, there's some things that we're looking at, dielectric propulsion, uh, on propulsion, things like that. Those are very small systems now, producing very small thrust. They are usable, or you need a thrust for a long time to go to some planetary missions. But there again, that's almost like using brute force. What you're suggesting is a way to get around brute force. That would be nice if we could find some way to come up with some smart way that would just eliminate the effects of gravity on the hardware that we're trying to boost. Werner von Braun, who developed the V-2 rocket, came to the United States after the war and was to come using his broadcast power without wires, based upon his proposed project at Long Island. In this particular article, he talks about an aircraft that he wishes to build that will run by electricity, without propellers, without rudders, and at a speed of 350 miles an hour. I'll read you his words. The new self-propelled aerial teleautomaton, devoid of propeller, sustaining wings, and all other means of external control. It can attain a speed of 350 miles an hour, and that was fast in those days and will reach a predetermined point a thousand miles away accurately within a few feet. And so it was that I discovered Tesla's second great dream to build a wingless electric aircraft. Tesla, every decision that he made was based on what he could do to build a better propulsion system, something that was capable of, of taking us, for example, to the moon or at least into space. You know, we've come a long way since World War II the propulsion of these rockets. Where is the future leading us? Well, the thing that we need now is we need a breakthrough in a new concept in propulsion. That when we talk about chemical propulsion, we have stretched it just about as far as we can. We've always thought uh, that the major advances to mankind came out of war. But what we need is an anti-gravitational device or something like that. Yeah. Do you think that is possible? Who knows? Anything in the, in the future is possible. What about uh, the past? I, I look at the uh, pyramids, for example, and I am not convinced that we did not at that time have some type of anti-gravitational device that assisted those people in putting those huge stones in place. I, I think it was possible then. I think it is possible in the future that we will come up with some technique that can uh, allow us to lift enormous masses with very little force and uh, very an expenditure of very little energy. If we could find some way to come up with some smart way that would just eliminate the effects of gravity on the hardware that we're trying to boost. It will be practicable to project a missile of this kind into the air. We picked up the pieces, it was hauled away, there was a special project set up to examine, and so on and so forth. Here we are 35 years later. Why don't we have these things? Why haven't we duplicated the technology involved? Why aren't we flying, flying saucers? Consider this. Suppose that a modern F-16 fighter aircraft crashed into a field outside of, say, Washington, D.C., in the middle of the American Civil War in 1862. <clears throat> How long, then, would it take President Lincoln's finest scientific advisors <clears throat> to figure out how it worked, duplicate the technology involved, and use it against the Confederacy? The answer is, it couldn't have been done. They might have been able to tell you that it flew in there but they certainly wouldn't have been able to tell you how because the laws of aerodynamics were on island at the time. They might have been able to tell you it was metallic, but they would have had problems analyzing it because many of the metallic elements involved were considered at that time to be unknown. Aluminum only developed a couple of years, well, I guess 20 years earlier than that, and something that no one used in the Civil War because the melting point was too high. They couldn't work with it. <clears throat> Other metals, titanium, 
you know, those sorts of things either were unknown or so exotic that no one was able to do anything with them. Even something as simple as jet fuel, oil, essentially, would have been totally beyond their technology. The first oil well, indeed, was drilled in 1860 or 58 at Titusville, Pennsylvania. But the first process to crack oil and get gasoline and byproducts out of it was not developed until 1913. <clears throat> the pilot would have been an unusual creature indeed, assuming that he had perhaps some of the attributes common to 1980s human beings. Because consider this, in 1862, the average height was five foot seven. The average weight was something like 130 pounds. If we're dealing with a pilot six foot two and he weighs 180 pounds, he would have been a giant to those people. Yeah. And let's go, let's go a little further. Maybe he's got contact lenses. Or maybe he's wearing a plate, plastic tooth or teeth in his mouth, plastic. 1861, what on earth is that stuff? They might have known something about Bakelite, perhaps, but that's pretty primitive as far as plastic. And I'm not even sure that Bakelite was around in 1860. And, and electronically speaking, the technology of the aircraft itself, the electronics equipment on board that aircraft, and there's a great deal of it on F-16, would have been absolutely incomprehensible. In 1959, the U.S. government cooperated in the research and development of an elementary flying disc, but this project was prematurely abandoned. My own research in this field reveals that they had discovered a new principle, which they apparently failed to recognize in time to save their project. The Avro disc now stands on display at the Fort Eustis Army Transportation Museum in Virginia. Actually, it wasn't called the Avro disc, it was called the Avro car, it was its official name. And it was developed in the early 1950s by A.V. Rowe Limited in Canada. A.V. Rowe on one of their other projects, became interested in the air cushion and began to see if they could make a flying vehicle. After a few years, the United States Air Force became interested in this particular project and gave them some funding. Later on, the United States Army also became involved and provided additional funding for the project. But what the the army was looking for was a craft that could rise up in a ground effect and then from there take off into free flight. The auto car was powered by what? It was powered by three jet turbine engines. How did the air pattern work on it? Well, air was drawn in over the top of the vehicle and then was ducted down and blown out through the bottom. Sort of like the standard uh, hovercraft for sea uh, for channels. Precisely. Can you tell me something about its performance in flight? It really wasn't very good. It was able to raise itself to a height of about three or four feet, but they had very great problems with the stabilization of the craft. It was able to move backwards and forwards, but even there, as the films that we have shown, it was not able to move very fast. And I think perhaps that's the real problem with it, is that they were going in the wrong direction. The air cushion used by other people became very popular as hovercraft. The project finally came to an end in about 1962 uh, due to problems with the fact that the power was not sufficient and the stabilization also was creating problems. Development of the vehicle resulted in a gradual improvement from the relatively unstable first flight requiring rapid pilot input to various applications of the spoiler control system, which was abandoned due to lift loss with control applications, and ultimately to the introduction of the focusing control ring, which resulted in the most significant improvement to date. In the most recent configuration, with the addition of the pneumatic control boot, the vehicle displayed stable flight characteristics at a height of 3 feet and at speeds up to 30 knots. 
The wind tunnel test data showed, however, that the focusing ring control, though it had been developed for satisfactory hovering, was not good enough for forward flight, and that fairly extensive modifications were required to add an improved forward flight control system. Testing was therefore discontinued until the two vehicles could be modified in readiness for further wind tunnel and flight test programs. Certain designs and inventions lodged with the U.S. Patent Office prior to 1959 revealed the name Agnew Bonson, but no further reference was found of him after 1964. In California, untimely death. He was killed in a plane crash in June of 64. Um, he was flying his own plane, it was a company plane. He crashed flying into a small airport in Worcester, Ohio, in the late afternoon. Um, the runway had been newly paved, the sun was shining directly down the runway. I flew in with him to that same airport and there were some power lines strung along one end of the runway. And I remember he said, someday someone will be killed here and then they'll take them down. And that's exactly what happened. I think he was thought of uh, by many people as being um, Crackpot. A crackpot, I guess. I didn't really say well, that, it, it but it on genius. It was, it's the same type of thing that, that for any person ahead of his time, that you know, people can only understand as much as they can grasp. He hired a number of scientists, among them Townsend Brown, and he was pursuing anti-gravity research. He was interested in building a flying saucer. Um, his other primary interest was world peace, and the two went hand in hand, to build a spaceship, an anti-gravity machine, to aid in bringing about world peace. And I was quite young at the time, but it was a fascinating place, it was something out of the movies with, with large um, electrical generating equipment. What type of a uh, electrical power system was your father using on his craft? you remember the names or the... I don't Tesla, know. Tesla coils. Tesla coils. Tesla coils. Tesla coils. How big would they have been? I remember some some standing units that were, let's see, I would have been, it would have been like nine feet tall. Nine foot yeah. Tesla coils? Wow. <laughs> Being only young at the time, the boys were unable to tell me anything about Townsend Brown. But J. Frank King, a co-worker on the anti-gravity project, told me the full story. It was the electrical propulsion. Incidentally, I was trained in aeronautics. My formal education was in aeronautical engineering, so that was another reason why I was interested in this sort of thing. And you were asking about Agnew Bonson and how he got into it. Agnew was a pilot also, so both of us had an interest in things that would fly. Uh, this was the early 50s when everybody was often interested in flying saucers anyway. And most of the people were trying to find some reason for their being here. Also, other people were trying to find how they could have, they could fly and they could do the things that people said that they could do, such as accelerate very fast, turn very quickly, fly at speeds that were beyond any capacity that we had with the type of drive systems that we had. It seemed to us that it wasn't a matter of developing a means of blocking gravity, but maybe developing a device that would uh, that would carry its own gravitational field. We needed somebody that had done more along the lines that we believed in, and we hunted for various people. Finally, decided that uh, T. Townsend Brown, that we had read about but had never met, was working along lines that we liked, and so we decided that we'd try to find him. And this was in 1957. And we finally located him. He had just gotten back from France, incidentally, where he had done for the French government a series of tests on moving structures using electricity as a prime mover. Thomas Townsend Brown, he was not the minority doctor, um, and is still alive, by the way, uh, <clears throat> is perhaps a very typical example of an individual who devoted the best part of his life to trying to understand and develop technology that the rest of the world didn't seem quite ready to accept. <clears throat> In other words, utilizing sophisticated capacitors, Townsend Brown proceeded to demonstrate that when properly charged with high voltage current, 
these capacitors would exhibit motion in the direction of the positive pole. He translated that to, into the uh, theory of the Beifeld bound effect, named after Paul Alfred Beifeld, who was an associate of Albert Einstein in Switzerland. He has done considerable work along those lines ever since the early 1920s. Townsend Brown, who had a, a military background, was a lieutenant commander in World War II, and had a nervous breakdown in 1943. Uh, we know he was uh, very depressed over the effect on the crew members of the, of the experiment and the subsequent experiment which took place at sea. Uh, he had previously been connected with his own project, uh, Winter Haven, uh, which had, had to do, uh, uh, probably uh, would have caused a tremendous breakdown, uh, a breakthrough in interdimensional travel, and was pulled off that project to work on um, the Philadelphia experiment. Suddenly a nervous breakdown, everything is. It's common knowledge in any government that people who have a history of nervous breakdowns are security risks. They're not given classifi classifications. There are indications that this work went on in spite of Townsend Brown under top secret government projects. But now in 1957, Townsend Brown was again working with electric discs, but this time for private industry. We wanted to work on a smaller scale. Apparently in France, he'd been working in an aircraft tank with a 16 foot tall piece of equipment a really large piece of equipment. We didn't think we needed anything like that. And then later, we developed a whole, a, a different system. You know, this BPL Brown would classically be electrohydrodynamics. And then later we went into magnetohydrodynamics where we were using coils. And these were toroidals usually, almost always toroidal coils because they were just easier for us to make for one thing. Uh, it seemed that it directed the energy more nearly where we wanted it to go. As Frank sketched the electric discs he'd been familiar with as a child, the tension and excitement mounted inside me. Here again was confirmation that my researchers back home in Australia were heading in the right direction. It looks from what I've seen there that your father was faced with the brute force problem. Now, I and my own research and uh, scientists that helped me in uh, Australia have been working on that uh, same problem. I think I've probably gone just a little bit further than your father may have in the lab. So I'm going to show you and see what your reaction is. Does this look familiar, gentlemen? Amazing. <laughs> Date number 1310990 lodged on 11 December 1970 by British Railways, detailed the technical data required to build a space vehicle powered by fusion energy. The space vehicle is circular in shape, and the primary source of particle emission is an array of lasers. However, in the middle of 1982, it was announced that the program had been abandoned. Is that shape or any part of it similar to what you were working with? Oh, yeah. Uh, at least three parts of it. The top part here. In the crafts that we worked with, we needed not only field shaping, which we achieved by this surface that might be parabolic, might be hyperbolic, might be something else, but, it, but at least a shaped surface, because we felt that the field had to be an unequal field. As the sun tried vainly to warm the cold North Carolina afternoon, I made my way into the city. There in the basement of the warehouse where Monson, Brown, and King had once worked secretly on their new propulsion system, I found a locked room. Inside, undisturbed for almost 20 years, were the very discs which had flown so noiselessly in a blue electrostatic haze for the magicians of that age. <laughs> 